Coming in at number five, we've got Jack Fiddler, Wendigo Hunter. And we'll kick this one off with not one, not two, but 14 purported Wendigo sightings. Possibly more if Jack wasn't able to get them before his untimely death. Back in the day, there was a man who claimed to be able to kill Wendigos. This man was known as Zauno Hisigo Galbo, but European settlers just knew him as Jack Fiddler. He lived in what's now known as the Sandy Lake First Nation and was a well-respected healer. He would go from community to community, ensuring the health of many people, but often he was sought out for more macabre business, fighting cannibalistic creatures. Jack would euthanize anyone who felt that the curse of the Wendigo was upon them. They sought him out to end their lives before they caused any trouble for their loved ones in their communities. Potions and ceremonies would mitigate damage, but death was the only surefire way to end a Wendigo's curse. And even then, it's a little tricky to deal with. So Jack would go from place to place, ensuring that Wendigos truly found their final resting place. After euthanizing the cursed individual, he would also perform a ritual cremation and burial to seal it away for good. Tales of his exploits eventually reached the Mounties, though, who did not seemed to think what Jack was doing was community service. After some investigation, they found out about a woman who was thought to be possessed. She was choked to death by her father-in-law and his brother. Any guesses as to who the brother was? Jack Fiddler. So the Fuzz arrested the men, claiming that what the law forbids, no pagan belief can justify. Jack eventually managed to slip away from the police before his trial and killed himself to avoid the long arm of the law. 14 counts of murder is a tough sentence, especially when assisted suicide and demon hunting were not considered valid defenses. Coming in at number four, we got the Wendigos of Blackwood Mountain. Boom butterfly effect. This pod of people eaters comes from the choose your own horrific adventure game Until Dawn, featuring a pre-Bohemian Rhapsody Rami Malek. In this game, you make decisions that will end up sealing the fate of eight unlucky vacationers. See, this group of pals decided to return to Blackwood Mountain a year after a tragic disappearance. They brought some friends up and pulled a nasty prank, resulting in one running off into the night. What the friends might not have known is that the area had been frequented by Wendigos for centuries. European miners came to the area back in the 1800s and were warned off by natives who claimed the mountain was sacred. As settlers tend to do, they ignored this advice and started excavating anyways. In doing so, they released the Wendigo spirits. Later on in the mid-1900s, a group of miners came back for some of those sweet, sweet minerals. They fell victim to some unfortunate accidents though and found themselves trapped in the mine shafts. Forced to cannibalize to survive, the remaining miners became Wendigos. After a powerful Wendigo was killed, its spirit was transferred to the unfortunate friend who ran off into the night. And you guessed it, this unfortunate individual came back with a vengeance. One by one, depending on how you play it, people fall victim to the Wendigo of Blackwood Mountain, sometimes becoming terrible creatures themselves. So next time you're in a survival situation, ask yourself if it's worth eating people and becoming a depraved monster in order to live. I'd take the long nap, to be honest. Coming in at number three, we've got Pet Cemetery. If you've only seen the movies based on this Stephen King tale, you might be a little confused. The feature films tend to skim over the folklore at the core of this resurrectory story. Sure, the ground is soured and stuff comes back to life, but why? Well, if you crack open a spicy little paperback, you'll find out exactly what happens. The spirit of a Wendigo plays a big part. The Creeds move into a lovely home near Ludlow and immediately run into trouble. The kids are getting hurt and the cat is killed by a passing vehicle. And soon enough, they learn about the Micmac burial ground near their residence. Apparently, it was abandoned because the ground was sour. Soon, they learn some tales detailing the Wendigo that lived around there. It would walk through villages late at night and anyone touched by it would develop a taste for human flesh. Eventually, it touched the burial ground itself, souring it and causing anything buried there to be possessed by it. This Wendigo spirit seems to orchestrate all sorts of terrible events in the story, playing with the emotions of the people around the Creed House. Some say that the Wendigo even manipulates the grief of everyone in the tale, causing them to act against their better judgment. Through this, it can possess more people and cause more terror. The horror of the Wendigo runs deeper than just the hunger for flesh and physical strength. Coming in at number two, we've got Wendigo Psychosis. There is some debate as to whether this disorder is real or not. If you look to the origins of the Wendigo legend, you can find plenty of association with the depths of winter. Without readily available food, often First Nations people would be subjected to famine. One who would indulge in the taboo of human flesh was considered to be possessed by an evil spirit, one that would never be satisfied. It makes sense, right? The idea of a cautionary tale involving a slippery slope existing everywhere. One slip up and you can descend into the depths of depravity. This seemed to be where the Wendigo legend originated.
originates, and since then, the Wendigo name has been used to denote a mental illness. Wendigo psychosis is said to be the uncontrollable craving for human flesh, even if other options are available. Often reported in the Northeastern American tribes, it started to die out once folks began to study and write about it. This caused a lot of folks to become skeptical, but the idea lived on. Plenty of tales concerning this sudden cannibalism have turned up over the years, and whether an actual Wendigo spirit has possessed these individuals, or if they're just experiencing a psychotic break, is hard to say. There's an account from some Jesuit missionaries traveling through New France back in the 19th century, where they came across some men with the mysterious psychosis. Keep in mind, these missionaries were likely deliberately painting any First Nations peoples as savages in need of religion, so maybe take this with a grain of salt. They claimed in their report that they met men so ravenous for human flesh that they pounce upon women, children, and even upon men, like veritable werewolves, and devour them voraciously without being able to appease or glut their appetite, ever seeking fresh prey and the more greedily, the more they eat. I mean, that does sound like a Wendigo, doesn't it? And coming in at number one, we've got Swift Runner. This is a man who claimed to have been possessed by a Wendigo. It seems that he was generally well-liked in his community. A Cree man, he was a tour guide that assisted visitors. In the late 1870s, he and his family moved into the woods. Unseen from the winter of 1878 until the spring of 79, the man came back and claimed that his family succumbed to starvation during the harsh winter. He did not look worse for wear, though. Suspicious of the supposedly starving man, folks went to find his campsite, and when they got there, they were horrified to discover human bones, picked clean and hollowed out. There was even a skull with a shoe in it. After this, Swift Runner admitted to cannibalizing his family. It didn't appear to be totally necessary, either. There were posts nearby that they could have used to get supplies, and the option to return to the community was still on the table. The answer to whether a Wendigo spirit had actually overtaken him died with him, though, as he was hanged for his transgressions. Cannibalism is scary enough on its own, but the idea of a Wendigo makes it that much worse. Come in number five. Need more children. If anyone ever says this phrase to you, feel free to run away at speeds previously unknown to man, or knock them out. You have my full support. However, if the individual in question ends up being a Wendigo, then you're probably not gonna have much luck with either of those tasks. They're just too strong and too spooky. And they get what they want most of the time, as evidenced by the story told by a now deleted Reddit user. I wonder how they're doing these days. I'll do my best to abridge this story for the sake of the length of today's video, so here we go. A man, his girlfriend, and their three-year-old son all went out of town on a camping trip. At the behest of his superstitious partner, our storyteller packed the classic camping supplies, plus a shotgun, rifle, combat knife, and machete. When they reached their campsite, they noticed that the park rangers were kind of on edge and didn't seem to notice that they brought a whole pile of weapons. Odd. Onwards they trudged, though, and set up camp. That night, they witnessed a horrible scene. It looked like someone had brutally killed a large animal, a buck perhaps, and dragged it away by the antlers. Not an easy task by any metric. Unnerved but resolute, they ate dinner and fed their son, then went to bed. In the middle of the night, a strange noise echoed throughout the woods, waking the man. He sat up and heard what sounded like muffled crying, prompting him to peek outside of the tent. What he saw, he couldn't quite explain. It was like an enormous deer, slightly misshapen with enormous antlers and a strangely human presence about it. The man didn't need to see anything else. He pulled out his gun and shot it multiple times, causing it to bleed and shriek. It didn't die though, and before it disappeared into the night, it said the words, need more children. The man and his panicked wife then passed out. The panic didn't disappear the next morning either, as their son was not in the tent with them. They called the police, who arrived to investigate the blood left by the creature, and the man seemed to overhear them say something about it getting more bold. Unfortunately, their son was never found. Coming in at number four, the Texas Wendigo. Traditionally, Wendigo are only found along the East Coast forests, around the Great Plains of the United States, and in the areas surrounding the Great Lakes. It's not often that you'll hear stories of them coming from other places, but parts of Texas are indeed located upon the Great Plains. And this Wendigo in particular made quite the name for itself in the area. From 2016 onwards, folks from the Yorktown, Texas area reported seeing a hulking figure almost 10 feet tall lurking around forested areas. It became such a common sight that a lot of people decided to avoid the woods altogether for a while. One intrepid explorer wanted to get a closer look at the thing, so he started frequenting the spots that it was most often sighted. During his search, he heard many noises characteristic of a wendigo, the sounds of wounded or dying animals, human-like shrieks, and even basic sentences, all meant to entice him into the woods. Whoever this guy was knew the wendigo's tricks, though, and stayed well away from anywhere he'd be vulnerable. One evening, with plenty of mist still hanging in the air, he ran into the real deal. 
feel. In an opening, he saw an old metal structure and two white houses, and between them a tall, lanky figure. It seemed to be spying on the inhabitants of these homes with devious intentions. He tried to ignore it as best he could as it walked along the path. Suddenly, a wave of overwhelming dread hit him and he got to running. Looking back behind him, he noticed that the Wendigo was now on all fours, but still stood at around 5 feet tall. Thankfully, it didn't give chase, as the man theorizes that this was because the Wendigo was more interested in the housebound prey. To this day, he still thinks about its bone white skin, bald head, dark black eyes, and humanoid face. He hasn't revisited the area. Coming in at number 3, we've got the frogs. Sometimes a story will draw you down one path and then pull out a twist so devious your spine will stay tingled for weeks. This is just such a tale. What do frogs have to do with the Wendigo? Well, just sit back and listen and I'll tell you a tale. This comes from Reddit user Unathana, who has a long history of listening to frogs make noise at night. When they were a kid, their grandmother would reassure them that the croaking was actually good as it kept the Wendigo away. Over time, they got used to the sounds and actually found them quite soothing. Flash forward many years and Unathana is enrolled in post-secondary education, taking a course on Native American literature. The Wendigo that they're learning about here is described a little differently than they remember their grandmother talking about. Frogs don't really do all that much to protect against such a creature. A damn shame. They then move to a new place on the edge of town within a stone's throw of a pond just packed with frogs. The noise was once again comforting to them and they tended to keep their windows open to hear them and enjoy the balmy summer heat. However, the night they recounted this story, things were different. Gone was the heat as well as the sound of frogs. In fact, it was unseasonably cold and the night was quieter than ever. This did not bode well for Unathana, not one bit. Every passing second meant more dread with nowhere to run or hide. The Wendigo is out there somewhere. Better watch out. Coming in at number two, we've got Anansi's Goat Man. One of the best known Wendigo green text tales, the proliferation of spooky encounter stories on 4chan's paranormal board had a large impact on creepypasta culture in the early 2010s, usually told from a first person perspective in bullet point form. Well, Anansi's tale starts as a green text, maybe to entice more readers to stick around, but soon becomes a more traditionally written story. It chronicles his trip out to Alabama to visit family and the very strange things that happened while in the rural landscape. He and some cousins went out to a little cabin slash trailer in the woods and brought some neighbors and other local kids with them. At first, it was just a smell, something like copper or blood that washed over the area. Nobody could explain it, so they tried to ignore it. Then strange figures appeared in the trees, making awful noises. Folks were freaked out, so they ditched the fire and went inside, which resulted in plenty of loud bangs at the door. Understandably, lots of people were scared and wanted to leave, but trekking back through the woods late at night with no weapons, with all this going on, seemed like a bad idea. They decided to stick it out till morning, and then leave once whatever rednecks in the woods stopped messing with them. Soon they realized that there were 12 people in the cabin at some point, and now they were just down to 11. Uh oh. So the next morning, some people left, but Anansi and his buddy Tanner stuck around with a few more folks. The copper smell came and left over and over again, and soon enough they realized that one of the people they were with was acting weird. She ran off, slack-jawed into the woods, and nobody saw her again. Tanner's cousin showed up later with a gun and claimed to have seen that girl gibbering alone in the woods. He tried to talk to her, but she didn't respond. Weird. On the last night everyone was at the cabin, somebody fired at the figure in the woods, causing it to scream and thrash for hours. During this time, everyone tried to get some sleep in the cabin while Tanner stood guard with the gun. Half asleep, he noticed someone come in from the bathroom and fall asleep on the floor. But that put their head count at higher than he remembered. It's a bad sign. Just to be safe, he continued to pretend to sleep in the guard chair and noticed that the new addition would convulse and thrash around from time to time. The next morning, everyone left except Tanner who said he'd lock everything up. Checking the bathroom that the extra body came in from, he noticed that the bathroom window was wide open. Whatever this creature was, it was infiltrating their cabin and pretending to be another person the whole time. Horrifying. And finally, at number one, we've got the gun nut green text. We'll cap off this list with one more green text, similar to Anansi's story, but with a different twist. A group of friends from college decided to take a trip out to an uncle's cabin. The stench of blood and copper was just as prevalent here, and over time, the strange event stacked up. The friends heard their own voices off in the woods, calling out for people to come find them. Dead animals were left all over the property, culminating in two halves of a deer being thrown at the side of the cabin. Thankfully, these pals were all a bunch of gun nuts with experience making homemade thermite, and when the going got bad, 
they got to work. Preparing to leave the cabin in the middle of the night, they had different rules for dealing with their Wendigo assailant. Some took point with rifles, while others packed their things. But at the last moment, after one pal went running off into the woods to see what he could find, they noticed something odd. A figure looking like their friend who had just run off was in the back of the cabin, appearing extra disheveled, pretending to pack up with the rest of them. This was their sign to open fire, and toss one of their homebrew thermite grenades after it. Even then, they can't be sure that they actually put an end to whatever shape-shifting creature was stalking them. The cabin ended up as ash though, so they're not planning on visiting anytime soon. Coming in at number 5, we've got the Stalker Challenge. Right on, you might hear that name and think it's one thing, but it's actually probably not the first conclusion your mind lands upon. The Stalker Challenge isn't about following someone around or testing a pal's skills at going unnoticed in the dark. It's actually a reference to a popular PC game called Stalker, where players explore an alternate reality Chernobyl exclusion zone. A lot of folks praise it for its lonesome and isolated atmosphere and the more realistic gunplay. Plenty of online military enthusiasts, survivalists, and Tarkovsky fans enjoy the game, so when we say that this Wendigo sighting was a result of the Stalker Challenge, we can probably assume the writer was a fan of Stalker and wanted to experience living life solo in the wastelands for a while. During this temporary hermitage, he worked his way into the middle of nowhere with nothing but some vodka, guns, and a harmonica. Like a true survivalist, he hunted some small game, made a meal of it, and explored the surrounding area. Snacking on the rabbit he'd hunted, he heard some rustling coming from the bushes, but didn't think anything of it. The next day, he was startled awake by some screaming. Weird, especially considering how far he was from civilization. Grabbing his rifle, he went off in the direction of the scream. It didn't seem to come from one singular location, and eventually the writer got lost. After a long day wandering around, he found his way back to the camp he'd set up, but now, somebody else was there. There was a humanoid form in tattered clothes, staring down at his fire pit, unmoving. Worried that this person might be injured, the writer called out to him. No response. After a few minutes of standing there staring at him, he again asked if he was alright. The humanoid figure turned to him and said, I wouldn't worry about it. This set off alarm bells for the writer who began to back away. At that point, the humanoid mentioned that he could go for another meal right now, prompting the writer to book it out of there. Hearing the humanoid running behind him, he turned around and shot blindly, apparently finding his mark. The creature screamed, the same scream from earlier, and seemingly disappeared. The writer eventually made it to the road and encountered a car. He didn't look back. Coming in at number 4, we've got the Nebraskan Wendigo. If you weren't already wary of traveling alone in Nebraska, now you've got a whole new reason. That's right, a new spooky story of someone's close encounter with a third kind. Maybe not an alien, but hey. This tale comes from a guy who was a farmhand when he was younger. One night, the farmer he worked for asked if he could figure out who was trampling all the corn stalks at night. Excited to take on guard duty, the farmhand stayed up to see if he could catch the culprit. Armed with the farmer's shotgun and the advice not to shoot unless absolutely necessary, he hung out in a lawn chair and walked around the field a few times. Eventually, he heard rustling from within the cornfield, followed by what sounded like giggling children. This, of course, was the most unsettling moment of the farmhand's entire life. Not wanting to hurt kids, but also not wanting to get children of the corn, he brandished his gun and told them to leave unless they were looking for trouble. The giggling stopped and the rest of the night went smoothly. However, the next morning, the farmer discovered something a little more disturbing than trampled corn. His cow, which had been left in the barn, was totally exsanguinated. All the blood in this animal was removed somehow and didn't leave any on the floors. The farmer called the cops and somehow managed to land on the explanation that it was some idiot kids, but the farmhand didn't quite buy that. However, the following night, both the farmer and the farmhand stayed up to see if they could find anyone. The farmhand, sitting in his chair again, heard the giggling once more. This time he asked whoever it was to reveal himself, prompting a gigantic humanoid creature with antlers to shuffle out of the field. Bad call, to be honest. The farmhand shot at the beast and began to run away. During his flight, he was tripped by a gopher hole and fell to the ground hard. Suddenly, it was morning and the farmhand was back inside the house, surrounded by the farmer's family. The farmer had told the cops that he was attacked by some random guy, but he chased him off. However, afterwards, the farmer took the farmhand aside and told him that he saw the beast too. It was on all fours after the boy tripped, and it took six shots from his rifle to scare it off. From then on, they didn't go out after dusk, and they kept guns on them at all times around the farm. Coming in at number three, we've got a Nevadan Wendigo. Not Nebraska, Nevada. This is a different tale, although curiously enough, the protagonist of this story is the same age as the protagonist of our farmhand extravaganza. Funny how that works. While exploring some abandoned mine shafts, great idea, I know, this lad felt as if he was being watched. Moving right along, he eventually encountered some old abandoned cabins. After looking through, he found a well, and this well stunk to high heaven. A strange, acrid, coppery smell, sort of a mix between fresh blood, rotten meat, and pennies. 
Not wanting to be around it anymore, he decided to head back towards the mine shafts. However, when he did, he saw something crouching inside of one. At first, he thought it was a mountain lion, as he'd seen them around these parts before, but then he realized how big the thing crouching in the shaft was. The openings were usually 8 to 10 feet tall, and this thing couldn't stand up straight inside of it. It moved towards the opening, revealing a bunch of matted brownish fur, and then it screamed. The kind of scream that haunts your dreams until the end of your life. Our explorer pal felt his blood go cold and immediately shot at this creature with his rifle. A few rounds to the torso did nothing to stop it, however, and it continued to scream. Time to run. He scrambled away, jumping over fallen trees and occasionally turning back to fire quick pot shots and check if it was close. Eventually, he made it back to his truck and hightailed it out of there, averaging 60 miles per hour. He drove without stopping until he got home where his dad was waiting. His dad asked him how the trip went and where he ended up, noticing that his son was quite shaken. When our mineshaft exploring storyteller explained to his dad where he'd been, his dad appeared concerned and told him to never go back to that location. They didn't talk about it again. Coming in at number two, we've got the Allegheny Forest Encounter. As I find more and more of these stories, I realize how absolutely terrifying the forest can be. Did I realize this as a kid when I went camping, or when I decided to go way off track while visiting remote cottages? Probably not, but I'm still here, right? This story comes from a hunter and his seasoned outdoorsman buddy. They'd gone fishing in the woods and made sure to prepare adequately. Black bears around that area, so they had their guns with them. After encountering a mangled deer corpse, they were a little unsettled. However, they chalked it up to a bear or maybe some coyotes and kept moving. A little while later, something set off the buddy's spidey senses and he asked for his gun. Moving to the middle of the creek, they saw a bear running through the woods full tilt. It was followed pretty closely by a deer headed in the same direction. But why would a deer be chasing a bear? Well, it wouldn't. Something was chasing both of these creatures, something huge. From afar, it looked like a massive deer with superimposing antlers, but as it ran, it noticed the two hunters and moved towards them. When it got up close, they realized that it had a huge maw full of teeth that could only be described as belonging to a carnivore. That was all the warning they needed. Shooting at the beast while running away, they made sure to put as much distance between them and it as possible. Eventually, they made it to a plateau where nothing seemed to be wrong. Reloading their weapons and looking around for any sign of trouble, they realized they were in the clear. Miles from their base camp, they hiked all the way back on high alert, but never encountered the creature again. Even now, they have no idea what the hell they ran into. And at number one, we've got another farm experience. This one doesn't stem from working on a farm, though. It stems from living on one. When the writer was about 13, he and some friends lived in a rural area and would often get together to goof around in the woods. Meeting at one friend's farm, they chased each other around with sticks for a little while. However, our narrator ran off and stumbled upon a dead deer with some limbs missing. This led to the discovery of a bunch of dismembered animal parts strewn about the entrance to the woods. At that point, most of the friends went back to the farmhouse, while our fearless storyteller and a couple more pals went to investigate. This expedition resulted in the discovery of a dead cow with missing ribs, broken legs, and a head picked clean of soft tissue. Yuck. That was it for the night, and everyone got home safe. About a week later though, while hanging out near his house, the storyteller heard what he thought was his dog. Thinking he would rush out of the bush and beg for a treat, he wandered in the direction the noise was coming from, but what came out of the bush was not his dog. It was a shambling abomination, walking around like a newborn doe, covered in viscera with teeth as sharp as knives. Needless to say, he ran right inside. That night, while gripping a baseball bat in bed, he heard an awful scratching upon the wall outside his room. As this happened, his dog started freaking out, barking at the back door. Our storyteller rushed downstairs and and grabbed the dog, double checking that his door was locked, and he stayed up all night listening for more. The noises eventually subsided and dawn broke. In the morning light, he peeked outside the door and saw an assortment of pig's feet strewn about the porch. Yikes. Number five, some strange noises. One of the creature's signature calling cards is said to be its horrific wails, its pained shrieks that don't sound like any animal you'd recognize. It's also said that it's been able to imitate human voices to better lure out its prey. And perhaps those disconcerting sounds were caught on tape. As recently as 2019, when a series of howls and shrieks left a hunter and a government biologist searching for answers as to what was going on in those woods. Gino Mikas was hunting with his wife and grandson in northwest Ontario in a fairly remote rural area, about 50 kilometers away from the nearest sign of civilization, most likely an on route. Sorry for the rest of the world, that joke is just for Ontario, it's a Canadian cryptid, what can I say? At first, I thought it was a moose, but my mind changed when it screamed again and again. Mikis is an avid hunter, a resident of Sioux Lookout, and knows his way around the woods and what creatures should be living in it. He added on saying, I've heard many different animals in the wild, but nothing like this. I grew up hunting with my grandfather for the first 12 years of my life. 
The howls initially came from the distance, but soon appeared closer. We've got the clip, so why don't you take a listen for yourself and see what you think. Now some speculated that it could be a grizzly bear, however, there's not a lot of evidence for that since grizzlies don't really live in these surrounding areas. They are known to roam, but there's not reports of grizzly bears nearby. Others speculated that it could be a wolf, which definitely is possible, but you would think that an expert seasoned hunter would recognize a wolf. So there's a number of people who speculate that this could be the mythical wendigo caught on tape. And if you're looking for way more stories of folklore, creatures, cryptids, well, you already know what channel I'm going to recommend. And it's the one you're watching right now. We've got tons and tons of scary lists just waiting for you to discover. So hit that subscribe button. Please make sure to hit that bell so you don't miss a single scream and get all caught up. But do that at the end of this video if you wouldn't mind. I got way more Wendigo sightings coming up for you. Number four, Southern Ontario sighting. Our next story also comes to us from my home province of Ontario. Makes a lot of sense. It's where a number of regional myths revolving around the Wendigo all originally stem from. Now this one comes to us from an anonymous redditor who posted to the Skinwalker subreddit detailing a strange encounter that they had possibly with the creature. You take a listen to this. I decided to take my dog out for a walk this afternoon and not put my headphones in. As we were walking along, I heard a voice calling out my name in a sing-songy way. I stopped and looked around and I called for my dog to come back to me and he stopped where he was and stared at me for a while and then eventually came to me. I didn't acknowledge it. I walked around a little more and still didn't see anything. Now, I live with my parents and my mom knows that stories about skinwalkers freak me out. A few days ago, we were having a bonfire and she hid and tried to call for me in a scary voice to freak me out. So I assumed this was the same thing happening. I continued walking and I heard come over here and I was so freaked out because this sounded like it was my voice saying it and I heard this so much more clearly like it was coming from inside my head. I have no idea what was out there this afternoon but I can tell you for certain I will never walk out there without my headphones on again. Can honestly say this was the weirdest experience of my life. Now if you believe the legends and folklore, if you hear the creature calling out for you, the only correct thing to do is to ignore its attempts to lure you away. You don't want to go toe to toe with this thing. You're not going to stand a chance. So it sounds like the original poster in this situation, even though they were scared out of their wits, still made the right decision and got off with just a scare and a story instead of something much, much worse. Number three, the man in my scope. This next story comes to us from an interview that a YouTuber Funkalopagus did with a hunter who thinks he had an encounter with the creature or something else deeply strange late at night. He originally posted this story to Reddit with the name Perpetual Connection, so that's what we'll call him if it comes up. He says he was hunting boar. He was saving up for a while to get a special thermal vision scope. He took it to a range and waited from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. to find a good boar to bag, but surprisingly wasn't finding anything. And he noted that the area that he went up to was shockingly empty of wildlife, no deer, no rabbits, no coyotes, nothing, as opposed to it usually being pretty plentiful. So he was getting himself ready to leave, assuming it must have just been a bad day, when he heard a crunch come from the direction that he'd entered the park. So he raised his scope to see what it was and saw initially what he assumed was a bear, some big mass on his scope. He zoomed in a bit and jolted when he realized it wasn't a bear, but looked a bit more like a man. Now what was disturbing him was that he was about 30 miles away from any other public areas. And there were no other cars parked around, no wildlife to speak of. The only other living thing next to him was this person in his scope, who happened to be completely naked, twitching and grabbing at all the foliage. The OP then says that the mysterious figure looked up at him and in an extremely unsettling, high-pitched feminine voice began to call out for help. The hunter believed that he was being trapped and scrambled to escape. He said it didn't sound like this voice should be coming from this entity. And he said that the creature was staring at him with a wide smile and unfurled itself standing on its back legs, standing six feet tall or maybe more. He pointed his weapon at the unknown entity and warned for it to stand down and said that it arched on its fours again and hissed at him like a cat before disappearing into the brush, screeching in a wail. The hunter would return to his car and drive off in an absolute panic. I think like most 
of us would, and he would tell authorities what he saw, but he was only reprimanded for hunting at night. I mean, fair enough, if I reported that story to the sheriff or something, I think I as the sheriff would hear that and just, you know, Scratch that off, be like, oh, I'm not messing with that. So what do you think? Did he happen to come across someone in the woods who was just having a wild night on all of the substances? Or was that a close encounter with death that he narrowly avoided? Number two, the 2019 sighting. This next sighting happened in 2019. It's the same time as the first point. Coincidence? Absolutely, but worth mentioning nonetheless. This next story was posted to Reddit by a user named Bradley Innovates. Bradley tells about how he had just been discharged, honorably, don't worry, from the Marines and was returning home to his home state of Alabama. Sweet home Alabama. And was catching up visiting on old friends. His best friend Jacob in particular, the two of them had been friends their whole life and usually got up to, you know, boyhood stuff, hanging out in the woods, that kind of thing. The two of them traveled out to a secluded campsite that they'd enjoyed when they were younger bringing a long arm with them for target practice. The two were chatting and eventually got onto stories of cryptids in the woods, namely, you guessed it, the Wendigo. His friend told him one could summon this creature by speaking its name three times into the woods like Bloody Mary. I've said its name like nine times in this video. I'm speaking into a camera, so I hope that's okay. I hope I'm not cursing you out there. Might be best just to sage your house a little bit after watching this video. Anyway, Bradley played along and spoke his name out three times only to discover nothing happened until he heard a snap in the woods, and his reflexes instinctively darted backwards. A few coyotes ran by, and his friend decided that it was enough scares for the woods and started to pack up when a tree began to fall forward towards them. Now, if that wasn't already unnerving, the Redditor said the next thing he heard was the voice of his friend's younger sister calling out to them both, except they didn't bring her along, and she wasn't anywhere nearby, and that's when both of them knew they were in far deeper trouble than they thought. They claimed that they saw an emaciated fleshy monster, deathly thin, with next to no meat on its bones, skin as pale as ash, and a vibrant blue eyes. That actually sounds pretty familiar, to be honest. The men fired at it and ran screaming from the woods towards their car. They escaped, horrified by what they saw, but luckily alive. If this story is true, then that has to be a real life encounter with the creature. Number one, Jack Fiddler. There truly aren't many sightings or stories of Wendigos, and indigenous people don't particularly like to share these stories out of their tribes. Despite the popularity on apps like TikTok, it's a pretty niche bit of folklore. Of course, it could also be because there are people out there maintaining the local population. Jack Fiddler, or Zanhano Gahengo Gawa, was an Ojibwe shaman living in Sandy Lake in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He was renowned among his people for being a hunter of the supernatural, defending his tribe from threats that no one else would be willing. There are many documented cases of indigenous people who feeling themselves lose control to the appetite or the spirit within them would request that someone close and trusted would be the one to finish them off. This could be a close friend of the family or a family member. It was an act of mutual trust. Zan Hano Gahengogawa claims to have felt 14 Wendigos during his lifetime like this. Of course, not everyone would see it this way. By 1906, word would reach the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the Mounties, that to them, there was a, well, this is a quote, a band of pagans in the habit of killing one another whenever one gets delirious through fever or other causes. By 1907, the mounted police had arrested Zanhano Gahingogawa and his brother Pescoquan for the death of Pescoquan's daughter-in-law. Locals in the tribe decried the decision, saying they didn't understand, and that the man they were accusing of being a killer was a quiet, dignified man who lived with a clear conscience. After 15 weeks of imprisonment, Zan Hano Gahingogawa would escape from the police escort holding him. When they found him, he was lying on a rock with a sash tied and a knot around his neck. It was his way out of escaping persecution. Coming in at number 5, we've got a Nevadan escapade. This story comes from a self-proclaimed survivalist living in Nevada. They open up the tale with a bit of a disclaimer, saying that they never really believed in the paranormal before this happened. In fact, prior to experiencing this, they would have assumed that anything strange going on would likely be the result of government experiments and the like. There was absolutely no way they expected an experience like the one I'm about to summarize. So the survivalist had a couple weeks of vacation saved up and didn't want to let it roll over to the next year. Taking that time off, he didn't really know what to do with himself. After a day of doing nothing, he decided to go camping on his own as none of his friends were able to take any time off. Away he went, packing some basic supplies and grabbing coffee and donuts on the way out. After setting up camp in the middle of nowhere, the survivalist decided to have a little vodka and do some target shooting. 
Following an encounter with a jackrabbit, he came across a freshly killed coyote. Seeing as hunting coyotes is relatively common practice in Nevada, he didn't think much of it, but he still saw the way the body was left as strange. Weird smell, too. That evening, while scanning through some capped channels on his ham radio, the survivalist came across something odd. Knowing that there was military presence in the area, he wasn't too surprised to hear the sounds of gunfire coming through the speaker. However, these war game sounds were followed up by what he described as nails on a chalkboard and a blood-curdling scream. Immediately after hearing these noises, the radio crapped out. Uh-oh. Reassuring himself that whatever happened there was hundreds of miles away, he went to bed. The next day, while puttering about, he wandered into a fenced-off military area, letting him know that whatever those noises were last night, they were probably closer than he assumed. Exploring this area more, he came across a cave that piqued his interest. Heading inside, he didn't notice anything odd at first, but soon became attuned to a very particular rotting smell the same smell he noticed when coming across the oddly killed coyote. This tipped something off in his head and he got the hell out of there. At that point, the survivalist was terrified. Returning to his camp, he found that it had been raided. Everything was torn up, tossed about, and emptied, and nothing was missing though. While checking on his equipment, he noticed that all of the sounds in the area had stopped. Dead quiet as night fell. And that's when he saw it. A humanoid creature standing off to the side, looking straight at him with dark voids for eyes. Hell, it even looked like it cracked a little smile. The survivalist tried to shoot it, but his bullets didn't seem to do anything but piss it off, making it scream in an ungodly fashion. Seeing that his weapon wasn't doing much, he booked it out of there and found a crevice to hide out in until sunrise. And when the sun rose, he got the hell out of there. ASAP. Coming in at number 4, we've got the Forest Ranger. Being a forest ranger must be fascinating, right? Out in the wilderness all day, every day, minimal human contact, keeping an eye on the local flora and fauna, occasionally taking part in rescues, maybe helping a lost hiker find their way, wearing a cool hat. What a life. Of course, it isn't all fun and games. There are plenty of harrowing situations one can find themselves in when deep in the forest. However, mythical monsters don't usually come up during job training, so you better watch out. Take this tale from a forest ranger somewhere in the States. While responding to a missing persons report, they found themselves in a tricky area of the hiking trail. At some point it splits, with one of the paths leading people deeper into the forest instead of back to the service area. Naturally, the ranger called for some backup, and about a half hour later, his backup showed up. Ranger and backup head off into the woods, calling out for the missing person, but to no avail. And when they got to the split in the path, Mr. Backup disappeared too. Trying for a while to contact the missing backup on their walkie, the ranger got a little spooked. Then, when all hope seemed to be lost, he ran into someone matching the description of the original missing person. However, this individual didn't respond to anything the ranger said to them. The ranger took the person back to their truck and told them to wait in the back while he went to look for his backup again. At this point, his backup chimed in on the walkie, saying that he had found the missing hiker at the bottom of a hill with a broken leg and would be returning with him soon, which didn't line up with what he had seen. The ranger went back to the truck and saw that it was empty, with the passenger door wide open and the cage inside bent out of shape. Apparently that kind of stuff had been happening for a while, too. Folks hearing their neighbors calling out in the night when they knew their neighbors were on vacation, or perhaps hearing their dog barking outside when the dog was at the foot of their bed. Coming in at number 3, we've got a Deep Woods Discovery. Uh, there's nothing quite like having your expectations subverted, yeah? I don't want to spoil too much of this story before I tell it, so here we go. I found this one in green text format, and it seems to be coming from a person living in a rural area. Every year, they find that hiking in the wooded area near their home is quite pleasant in the fall, so they head out to do just that. However, they seem to find some of the more overgrown areas unsettling makes sense, especially if you're far away from society at large. As they explore a little more, they notice something dive into the bushes, giving them a start. At that point, the hiker has had enough and decides to book it. There's something nearby though, and it seems to be following quite closely. Eventually, the hiker makes it to the end of the trail and realizes that they have to go back where they came from. After the experience they had, they're not looking forward to it. In the end, they do indeed buck up and head back to the top of the trail. When they get to the part where they saw something dive into the bushes, they realize that it wasn't a monster or anything sinister, but in fact a little girl. She calls out for help, but as the hiker gets closer, a strange feeling washes over him. It looks like the girl is hurt and can't walk on her own, but when the hiker gets close enough for the little girl to see him, she begins screaming bloody murder. Oh no. It's at this point that the hiker gives up all pretenses and eats the girl taking her form. Bet you didn't see that one coming. 
Coming in at number two, we've got the Moose Man. Let's take a quick trip to Alberta, except instead of seeing the mountains or hockey, we'll go looking for shape-shifting terrors. Hooray! There were tales circulating around for a while about some sort of centaur with moose features instead of horse ones, although many claim these to be patently false. That's not going to stop me from talking about it as if it were real though. This thing lived by the river and never got too close to human settlements. However, it would often kill and mutilate game animals to make them unusable. In fact, it's also said to have been involved in the killing and maiming of many men as well. Beyond the moose-centaur comparison, there isn't much to be said about the way this creature looks. It's huge, as all moose tend to be, and walks around with flesh hanging from its antlers. Like many creatures in the same vein, it reeks of something otherworldly and tends to make hideous noises when encountered. Whether the moose look is its only avatar or one of many forms, we may never know. And finally, at number one, we've got the Roadrunner. Meep meep indeed. While walking his dog at around 10pm, our storyteller came across a couple dead rabbits accompanied by a horrid stench. Assuming it was just a fox or something, he moved right along. Soon after, his dog started acting super weird though. It wouldn't move at all and seemed to be staring at something off in the distance, eyes wide. Then the smell came back. This time he couldn't quite place where it was coming from, but he'd heard enough stories about bad smells and evil vibes in the woods to know to be careful. He took his dog and got off the path, hiding in some tall grass to the side. That's when he saw it, something almost indescribable. Gray skin, rotten flesh, a horrible, emaciated horse's head, limbs that only seemed to half work. Made him want to run away at full speed immediately, but that was a bad call with it so close by. Sneaking seemed to be the better choice. The man and his dog started creeping away and got about 50 feet. The creature was out of sight now and the man thought he could start running. But apparently the roadrunner knew exactly where he was trying to sneak away to and was immediately on his tail. Thankfully, the sneaking gave this man and his dog a bit of a head start and they were off to the races. As they ran from this awful beast, the man could hear it breathing. It sounded like an overexcited child, happy to be running in the woods in search of something good. Thankfully, getting back to the jagged gravel path proved to be a challenge for the roadrunner. Whatever was wrong with its limbs made it difficult to traverse the rocky terrain, and eventually it gave up, screaming all the while. The man hasn't seen the creature again, but that's no guarantee that it's not around. Shapeshifting isn't uncommon with these kinds of things. Number 5. The Literal Legend the Wendigo story has some variation between tribes, but most of the general details are the same. My research has shown that some tribes believe that the very first Wendigo was a warrior who made a deal with an evil spirit in exchange for the skills, strength, and stature to defeat his foes and save his tribe. He was transformed into the Wendigo, and after the battle was banished by his people. Wendigo is a malevolent spirit who possesses people, with some versions of the tale having this be a result of a person's greed, and others having a more disturbing cause. A common version of the legend is that when people are caught in times of famine or in extreme survival situations, they sometimes have to resort to eating human flesh in order to survive. This resulted in them transforming into a Wendigo, who would have an intense craving for human flesh that could never be satiated, no matter how much they consumed. Some tribes describe the Wendigo as a creature who grows with every person they eat so that they can never be full, making them simultaneously starving and gluttonous. In his book The Manitus, The Spiritual World of the Ojibwe, First Nations teacher and scholar Basil H. Johnston gives the following physical description of the creature. The Wendigo was gaunt to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones. With its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets, the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, unclean and suffering from the separation of the flesh. The Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition of death and corruption. Wendigo's level of cunning in speech vary from version to version, with some tales having him imitate the voice of a loved one in order to coax their victims closer. A particularly disturbing folk story that was part of a compilation of tales assembled by a scholar named Lottie Marsden in Ojibwe Myths and Tales Archaeological Report of the Canadian Institute goes as follows. One time long ago, a big Wendigo stole a boy. But the boy was too thin, so the Wendigo didn't eat him up right away. But he travelled with the boy, waiting for him to get fat. The Wendigo had a knife and he'd cut the boy on the hand to see if he was fat enough to eat, but the boy didn't get fat. They traveled too much. One day they came to a village and the Wendigo sent the boy to the village to get some things for him to eat. He just gave the boy so much time to go there and back. 
The boy told the tribe that the Wendigo was near them, and showed them his hand where the Wendigo cut him to see if he was fat enough to eat. They heard the Wendigo calling the boy. He said to the boy, hurry up, don't tell lies to those people. The tribe went to where the Wendigo was and cut off his legs. They went back again to see if he was dead. He wasn't. He was eating the marrow from inside of the bones of his legs that were cut off. The tribe asked the Wendigo if there was any fat on them. He said, you bet there is. I've eaten lots of you. No wonder they are so fat. Then they killed him and cut him to pieces. This was the end of this giant Wendigo. Number 4. The Purpose of the Legend Whether the native people believe in the Wendigo as a literal creature or merely as a legend depends entirely on the individual's beliefs and who you ask, and it's frankly really not for me to say. There are certainly a significant number of believers who report sightings, but for the purpose of this entry on the list, let's look at the Wendigo from the perspective that it's a folk legend that was created and passed down for a purpose beyond LOOK OUT SNOW MONSTER! Many scholars believe that the Wendigo was created as a cautionary tale and a deterrent. As any Canadian will tell you, the winters here can be long and brutal. This would result in hunting parties being trapped in storms and there being extreme food shortages. In such extreme survival situations, it would not be uncommon for people in their desperation to consider eating members of their community in a last ditch effort to survive. This was considered extremely taboo, obviously, and the prevailing idea was that in these situations it was the proper response to face famine with resignation and a readiness for death. This lends credence to the idea that the legend was created as a deterrent and a cautionary tale to prevent members of the tribe from eating each other during the long, brutal winters, telling them that indulging in the consumption of human flesh would transform them into a hideous and ravenous monster who would be hungry forever. Some have suggested that the Wendigo's appearance is a reference to the harsh elements of the winter, with their emaciation being reminiscent of the hunger winter caused and their tattered and bloody lips being reminiscent of the enduring ravages of frostbite. If the tribe believed that someone could also be transformed into a Wendigo due to greed, what better way to deter it than to tell the greedy party to shape up so that they could avoid turning into a Wendigo? The taboo against Wendigo-like actions were so strong that during times of famine, tribes such as the Assiniboan, the Cree, and the Ojibwe would reinforce the supposed dangers with a ceremony known as Wendigo Khan Zim Owen, where people would wear masks and dance backwards around a drum. Although the Wendigo works well as a deterrent to man-eating, it is also used in a less literal way that is essential to keep in mind to understand the deeper meaning of the legend. Number 3. Wendigo as a Metaphor Beyond viewing the Wendigo as a literal monster or as a boogeyman created to prevent people from eating each other in desperate times, some people view the Wendigo as a metaphor for greed and its all-consuming nature, helping to reinforce the communal values that let members of a tribe live well together in their environments. Interestingly, native scholars have used this metaphor in modern contexts to great effects. For example, in his 1978 book Columbus and Other Cannibals, The Wetico Disease of Exploitation, Imperialism, and Terrorism, Dr. Jack D. Forbes uses the Wendigo as a metaphor for the attitudes and behaviors of domination and exploitation enacted on his people. As he writes, I have come to the conclusion that imperialism and exploitation are forms of cannibalism, and, in fact, are precisely those forms of it which are most diabolical or evil, going on to say that the treatment of minorities clearly attests to the fact that, quote, the wealthy and exploitative literally consume the lives of those they exploit. This really shows how effective this legend is as a metaphor for greed, working just as well in a tribal setting to prevent people from hoarding what little food was available as it does in a modern setting where imperialism's need to make others suffer for the benefit of a ruling class is explored. So, from a metaphorical standpoint, the Wendigo is undeniably real. We just call it CAPITALISM! Number 2. Wendigo Psychosis whether the Wendigo is real or not, there are documented examples of people going mad and engaging in Wendigo-like behavior. People who crave a more scientific explanation coined the term Wendigo psychosis to explain this behavior. The term is controversial, but has been applied to instances in the past as a means of explanation. For example, in the 1661 Jesuit Relations, which were published progress reports by Jesuit missionaries reported about an incident that was believed to be the result of Wendigo possession, but has later been labeled as Wendigo psychosis. Here is the translated quote. 
What caused us greater concern was the news that met us upon entering the lake, namely that the men deputed by our conductor for the purpose of summoning the nations to the North Sea and assigning them a rendezvous were there to await our coming, had met their death the previous winter in a very strange manner. Those poor men, according to the report given to us, were seized with an ailment unknown to us, but not very unusual among the people we were seeking. They were afflicted with neither lunacy, hypochondria, nor frenzy, but have a combination of all these species of disease, which causes them a more than canine hunger. This makes them so ravenous for human flesh that they pounce upon women, children, and even upon men like veritable werewolves, and devour them voraciously, without being able to appease or glut their appetite, ever seeking fresh prey, and the more they consumed, the more greedily they ate. This ailment attacked our deputies, and as death is the sole remedy among these simple people for checking such acts of murder, they were slain in order to stay the course of their madness. Another strange case was a Plains Cree trapper named Swift Runner in Alberta, who was starving with his family in 1879 when his oldest son died. He consumed him, but went on to end the lives of and eat his six remaining family members. This was attributed to Wendigo psychosis due to the fact that he was only 25 miles away from a Hudson's Bay Company post, which had emergency food supplies, showing that his actions were not a last ditch effort to avoid starvation, but a horrific and crazed act. This real behavior reinforced the belief in the Wendigo, but I promised I would tie this all back to the government, and I will. The Canadian government. Number one, real Wendigo hunters. This entry focuses more on the belief that the Wendigo is a spirit who possesses people rather than causes them to turn into a giant monster. This belief has caused a few situations where people attributed violent acts to possession by the Wendigo spirit, or in other cases took the lives of people thinking that they were possessed and that their death was the only way to prevent the dangers of the Wendigo from taking innocent lives. An infamous case was the story of Jack Fiddler, the chief and shaman of the Sucker Dudum among the Anishinaabe in the northwest Ontario. He was renowned among his people for his ability to defeat Wendigos, having claimed to have defeated 14 of them during his life. He said that some of them had been sent by enemy shamans and some were afflicted members of his own band. In these cases, many of the afflicted's family members, or oftentimes the afflicted themselves, would request that Fiddler euthanize them according to their people's rights before they turned Wendigo. Fiddler resisted efforts to have his people convert to Christianity, making them some of the only indigenous people left in North America who were living traditionally with very little government interference in their legal or religious matters. In 1907, two members of the Northwest Mounted Police heard about Jack Fiddler and his Wendigo fighting and decided that this was a perfect opportunity to introduce Canadian law to the North. They arrested Jack and his brother Joe for murder, keeping them in captivity while awaiting trial. Canadian newspapers picked up and sensationalized the story, saying that it involved devil worship and people across the country demanded a conviction, while the police investigating the issue viewed it as an opportunity for fame and advancement. Jack Fiddler escaped and took his own life, and his brother was charged despite testimony showing that the deaths had been euthanization of very ill people in an effort to protect their tribe and that they were ignorant of Canadian law. He was sentenced to death, although further appeals secured his release. Unfortunately, the release order came three days after he had died. Without their leaders, Jack's people were forced to accept government rule and signed Treaty No. 5. Oddly enough, the government has not been very open about the fact that they sentenced two men to death in an effort to assert their power and dominance and to bring fame and notoriety to their agents. See, I told you I'd bring it back to the government.